theatrical production hoping for stardom do you think god sits in a box seat find a quiet secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before god just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage the world is full of so called prayer warriors who are full of formulas and programs and advice peddling techniques for getting what you want from God. This is your father you're dealing with and he knows better than you what you need. The glory forever and ever. Amen. Greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to Living Strong. As always, we are delighted and privileged to be able to come to you uh, and share the Word of God with you, spend this time in the Word and in prayer with you. As we bring this current series of um, prayer, that we've been studying with prayer, but as we bring this to a close, uh, we would like to talk about one very important aspect of prayer, which is intercession. Now, intercession itself is a, a very large topic, and we could probably spend uh, several weeks on that, and we will do that uh, sometime in the future. We'll come back to prayer and uh, specifically uh, delve into the whole area of intercession. Uh, but today in this uh, closing program on the series of prayer, we want to talk about or at least introduce some important ideas about intercessory prayer, what it is and what are some of the key ingredients uh, that lead to a strong uh, life of an intercessor. Now, intercession simply means that you go to God on behalf of somebody else or some other people. So you could go to God on behalf of another individual, or you can go to God on behalf of another group of people or a community or a city or a nation, uh, but you are an intercessor. That is, you are meeting with God uh, on behalf of somebody else, and you are praying uh, 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 for, uh, for them. Uh, you're praying 
to God. You're lifting up prayers to God and you're interceding. Now, uh, intercession could also mean that you're standing before God on behalf of somebody else. But in the process, you're also standing against the powers of darkness. So there is the other aspect of intercession where you are actually contending from the presence of God as an intercessor against what the enemy is doing through your prayers and through the exercise of your God-given authority. So you're meeting with God, but intercession could also, and in many cases does also involve contending against uh, what the enemy is doing, what the powers of darkness are doing on behalf of another individual or uh, on behalf of another group of people. What is interesting is this, that God is looking for intercessors and people need intercessors. So on both sides, we find there is a wanted opening, a job opportunity on both sides, if you will. God is looking for intercessors and on man's side, people need intercessors. You know, and an intercessor, therefore, is a mediator. He's mediating between God and man. He's putting one hand on man, one hand on God, and he's mediating. Now, uh, the intercessor, in many ways, plays the role of uh, a mediator who is providing a ransom. He is providing something that causes God to move uh, in response to his prayer on behalf of the people he is interceding for. There is this important, very interesting idea, or truth, I shouldn't say idea, but a truth in the Word of God, the truth concerning a ransom. That means somebody is paying the price on behalf of somebody else, and in response to a ransom, God moves on the behalf of the people or the individual for whom ransom has been provided, and God moves on them. So an, an intercessor in some way is, is that being that ransom, being that uh, provision through which and because of which somebody else experiences God's working in their lives. You know, as you mentioned earlier, people need intercessors. And one of the great, some of the greatest verses on intercession we actually find in the book of Job. Now, we know what Job was going through. You know, uh, at the beginning of, of the book of Job, Job chapter 1, we see everything just going so fine with Job. You know, his life was great. Everything was good. He was a righteous man. He was also a wealthy man. He was a man who was blessed in all of his ways. He had plenty of livestock, cattle, servants, children, family. Everything was going good until something happened. And calamity after calamity began to come upon him, upon his livestock, his servants, his children, and finally his own health was affected. So Job was going through tumultuous times in his life from a time of great prosperity and peace and blessing, and suddenly he finds himself in, in, in everything about his life has fallen down. It's almost like the earth has been taken off from beneath his feet. And here he is in, 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 in total trouble and turmoil. And what is the one thing Job asks for in the midst of all that he's going through? You find in Job chapter 9, verses 32 and 33, here's what he says. He says, for he, that is God, is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we should go to court together. Nor is there any mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. You know what Job is saying? You know, I'm going through all of this time, but I can't even answer God. I mean, I can't take God to court. Uh, I, th that's not even possible. But what's the next best thing? He says in verse 33, there is no mediator between us who may lay his hand on us both. That means I wish there was somebody who would stand between God and me and mediate for us, who would speak to God on my behalf and who would try to settle this and find an answer to this predicament that I, I find myself in. You know, so Job's cry in the midst of all of his uh, difficulties is, I wish there was a mediator. Who, was lay, who would lay his hands on both of us, one hand on God, one hand on me. We find this, again, brought out in Job 16, verses 20 to 21. Job says, My friends scorn me. My eyes pour out tears to God. Oh, that one might plead for a man with God, 
as a man pleads for his neighbor. So Job says, you know what? You know, all my friends, they're just laughing at me. They're, you know, finding fault. and They're trying to find reasons for why I'm going through all of these difficulties. I wish I had somebody who would plead with God for me, just as a man would plead for his friend. So he's saying, I wish I had an intercessor. Instead of all these friends, you know, trying to find fault with me, I wish even one of them would be an intercessor on my behalf. So you can understand the heart of Job here. What is that one thing he's longing for? He's longing for an intercessor. He's longing for somebody who would go to God on his behalf. Rather than find fault with him, rather than try to, uh, you know, try to find reasons for all of his difficulties, just somebody would go to God and say, God, get Job out of his troubles. God, intervene. God, send deliverance. God, come through for Job. Get him out of all of his difficulties. Somebody would go to God and plead my case with God. That's what Job is asking for or longing for in the midst of all of his troubles. And you know, this is what people actually need. People need intercessors. When they are going through difficulties in their lives, they may not be able to go and pray. Sometimes uh, life can be so harsh and so painful uh, that they just lose all capacity even to have faith uh, in God and even to believe uh, uh, God. And sometimes some people are brought so low they even question uh, the very existence of God or the very love that God, love that God would have for them. And so uh, 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 they are brought to such a uh, position in life. And the one thing they need is somebody who would plead their case with God. They, are, they need intercessors. Now, they may not know that, but that is what they really need, as we understand here from the book of Job. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is our great intercessor. He pro, uh, his work on the cross in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, is depicted, among other things, as a great work of intercession. The Bible, he, Isaiah says, he made intercession for the transgressors. That means he, he, went to, he was, the work he was doing was in in one way, an intercessory work. He was going to the Father on our behalf, and he was offering his life that way as an offering for sin. And of course, you and I understand that today, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. He's interceding for us. You know, he's there on, 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 our, on our behalf, interceding before the Father. So, uh, if Christ is the great intercessor, then his church, his people, must also be intercessors. That's one uh, very important role that we step into as his church, as his people. Now we know some of the very familiar uh, scriptures on intercession uh, from the Old Testament where God teaches his people to intercede and we find that God looks for intercessors. We see this in Isaiah 59 and verse 16. In that chapter in Isaiah 59, uh, the prophet Isaiah describes the condition of the people. Uh, there is sin, there is rebellion, there is injustice. Truth has been abandoned and people are off into their own evil ways. And in the midst of all that, Isaiah 59 verse 16, God speaks and he says, you know, I looked and I saw for a man and I wondered that there was no intercessor. God was looking for one man to stand before him on behalf of that city and that nation. He looks for one man and he was wondering that there was no intercessor. There was not even one person who would plead before him, before God, on behalf of a people, of a city and a nation that had forsaken God. Not even one person. The same truth is brought out there for us in Ezekiel 22, verse 13, uh, where, you know, uh, again, Ezekiel describes in verse 29 the condition of the land and God says, and I sought for a man who would stand before me on behalf of the land. And uh, somebody who would make up the breach. That means there's a gap here. There's a very dangerous gap here. The breach in the wall really uh, has the picture of a city, a fortified city, but one section of the fort has been broken down. It's fallen down, which means it makes the entire city vulnerable to the enemy. The enemy has easy access to the city. But God says, I want somebody to stand in the gap I want somebody to make up that breach in the wall. That's the intercessor. He stands there and he brings God's protection. He brings God, God's preservation and God's deliverance for the people, for the land or for the individual. 
And so God says, I sought for a man who would stand before me for the land and who would make up the bridge, who would make up the gap. And God says, I found none. That means there was nobody who was willing to stand before me on behalf of the land, even though there was a bridge on the wall. The, the entire city was in a very, very vulnerable position or a situation. So God looks for intercessors. God looks for even one person who would stand before him on behalf of people, whether it's on behalf of another individual or on behalf of a city or a nation or a community. God looks for one person who would stand before him. That's how important intercession is. Both man and God are looking for intercessors. People need intercessors. God is looking for intercessors. And when people stand before him as intercessors, God takes notice. And he looks at their praying. He looks at their intercession as the ransom, as the means through which he will bring deliverance to the people who are being prayed for or interceded for. You know, uh, I want to just take a few moments here and mention a few things, uh, what we would call as ingredients for successful intercession. If I want to be a strong intercessor, if I want to be somebody who can really intercede well, uh, whether it's for other individuals or uh, groups of people, what would it take? And I want to share these few things as ingredients, things that I feel are really important. First of all, to intercede effectively, we must know the love that God has for the people. You know, as intercessors, we're not coming in to bring judgment on people, but we are really motivated by God's love for the people. God loves the person. God loves the individual. And we are working together with God to cause a work of God to take place in the individual's life or in the life of the city or in the life of that community because God loves them. God has a heart for them. God cares for them. He sees their predicament. He sees the difficulty. And so uh, a, a, an intercessor is really motivated by the love of God. Secondly, uh, uh, a second very important ingredient to uh, intercessory prayer is to desire to see change in the prevailing condition. That means you must have a desire in your heart. It should affect you. It should move you deep inside that you know, whether that individual or that community, they shouldn't be where they are. It's not right for them to be in that place, in that situation of bondage, in that situation of oppression, that situation of darkness. It should stir you on the inside and you must have a desire to see change in the condition that they are in. Whether it has to do with sin or darkness or bondage or oppression, you want to see change. God, this must change. This must not be allowed to continue. So, you need to be motivated by a desire to see change. And thirdly, the important aspect, ingredient for, for intercession is identification. That means you identify with the person or with the people that you are interceding for. You don't stand aloof or outside of them. You become one with them. That means their sins now are your responsibility. Their oppression is your responsibility. Their problems are now your responsibility. You identify with it. You feel they're hurt and you go to God because you identify with it. You know, when you see Daniel praying, he didn't say, oh God, the people have sinned greatly. When Daniel prayed, he said, God, we have sinned greatly. We have dealt wickedly. That means he's identifying with the sins of the people. Their wrongdoing now becomes his responsibility before God. And out of that is birth the prayer. The same thing when Jesus did his work of intercession on the cross. He identified with our sins. He who knew no sin became sin for us. He took upon himself our sins. And that's how he became our intercessor. So identification is a very important aspect, an important ingredient to intercession. Number four, of course, we have to be bold. That means we go before God and we ask for the impossible. It may seem impossible right now, but you're bold enough, you're courageous enough to ask God to change the situation whether it's over an individual or whether it's in a city or a nation, you ask for what seems impossible. That takes holy boldness to do that and to go before God saying, God, this must change. I'm asking you for change. And lastly, a very important ingredient for intercession is persistence, something we've talked about uh, on an earlier episode. You know, uh, when in intercession, 
many times answers don't come instantaneously. Things don't change overnight. Sometimes they do, but in many cases they don't change overnight. And that's where it takes determination. It takes persistence as an intercessor saying, I'm going to pray this through until I see the answer, until I see the individual delivered, or I, until I see that situation change. So it takes persistence for you to stay the course in your intercessory prayers for an individual or a group of people that you're going to God on behalf of. We're here to be salt, seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth, a light bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. We are in a crucial time in history where the urgency to fulfill God's mandate of reaching souls and making disciples has never been greater and more urgent. How is the body of Christ going to respond to this enormous challenge ahead of us? All People's Church began with a small congregation of 10 people. And with the mercies of God, we've grown to over a thousand people. And we have trained and released several people across our nation. But we are not going to stop here. God wants to do bigger and greater things than ever before through us. And so we need to be ready to release greater things across our city and across our nation. For this, we're getting ready to scale up and build APC World Outreach and Equipping Center. This will serve as an equipping center and a mission space using state-of-the-art technology to train, equip, release, and support ministers across our nation and across the globe. In phase one of this project, our goal is to acquire approximately five to six acres of land. That's the first step. In phase two, we are going to set up our Bible college and a media center. The Bible college will have classes that are equipped to train students, both residential and non-residential students. We'll also have the means to uh, provide distance learning so that students from around the world can participate in live classroom sessions as well as offline lectures. We'll also be able to bring in programs from reputed Bible colleges from around the world as well as international faculty who can come and equip pastors and worship leaders and worship ministries and other kinds of ministries. Think about the impact that we can have. If we graduate 200 students each year and each student in their lifetime impacts at least 1,000 people, then with every graduating batch, we are potentially reaching 200,000 people. In 10 years, this is 2 million people and counting. We'll also be able to set up a media center that provides content to reach a connected world, as well as it will enable us to set up satellite churches across our nation using technology. In phase three, we will be building our sanctuary where our church family can come together, be trained, equipped, nurtured, and cared for. To make this vision happen, we need your partnership. We know that it's gonna take some amount of sacrifice, but remember every investment you make today will reap great rewards for the kingdom of God in the near future. You can go to our church website, apcwo.org slash build to impact page, where we will give you information on how you can make your contribution or make your pledge of what you will be able to give in the months to come. And we look forward to your partnership. We want to thank you in advance for what you will do to be a part of this vision and to see it happen. Together, let's be salt and light in our city, a voice to our nation and to the nations. So let's work together to build to impact. We trust that this introductory message on intercessory prayer has opened your heart and mind uh, and has kindled inside you, stirred inside you a desire to be an intercessor. You know, all of us can be intercessors. It just takes a willingness to go to God on behalf of somebody else, to make the time and the effort and the place to do that. That's all it takes to be an intercessor. It doesn't require any great amount of spirituality. It doesn't require any great anointing. 
to be an intercessor. But you know, intercessors can affect the lives of individuals, of people, and even of nations. It's a great ministry that all of us can step into. And I hope and pray that you will be encouraged to be an intercessor. Step into it. Start praying. Simple prayers. And God will lead you on into a great ministry of intercession. We'll pick the subject of prayer up some other time and delve further into praying for individuals, praying for salvation, praying for cities, praying for nations, and, and just go on into other realms of prayer. How do we pray for revival? How do we pray for cities and, and nations and so on? So there's a lot more on prayer that we uh, still can talk about and we will talk about sometime in the future. Until then, let's pray together and bring this program to a close. Father, we thank you for all that we've learned in this, this time, Lord, where we've talked about prayer and explored various aspects of prayer. And I ask for a release of your supernatural grace and the empowering of your Holy Spirit upon our lives to help us become strong in prayer and see our prayer lives go to new levels, God, so that we could make a difference in the world because we pray. We thank you for doing this in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the program today. And until next time, live life the Jesus way.